One, two, three. All right. Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? My name is Time Dog, and I'm here to give you a tutorial on Crusader Kings 3, the part of the Tours and Tournaments DLC pertaining to the accolades for your knights. So, in the Tours and Tournaments DLC, a bunch of new changes were added, but one of the biggest ones and most opaque ones is the fact that you now have accolades for your knights. So, when you click to go manage your knights over here in the army, the military screen. You have all these slots up top to create new accolades. So when you select one, you'll have a choice from one of several of your knights to choose from. Now when you choose them, you may or may not be able to swap between accolades that they have available to themselves. This guy only has these two. This guy has a couple extra choices. Now there, you always have to have the minimum of the primary and the secondary accolade. However, the trait that you choose will actually change which modifiers that you get from the knight. So this video's intention is to kind of go over uh, some of the these accolades, which ones are the best, which ones are the worst, and how to get the most out of your knights. So I'm going to pull the uh, wiki over here. Let me just grab this bad boy. Zoop. And zoop. All right. So here we have the accolade screen. So, their honor is given to knights, cost 200 prestige, that enables them to gain glory. They need to have a minimum, minimum of 8 prowess to be given the accolades. When they die, it is inherited, so let's just create this one just for, uh, just for giggles. I think we'll do, uh, Fanatic, and... Do I like... I don't think I like Scoundrel, from what I remember. But yeah, we'll do Fanatic and Marauder, Marauder right now. Boop. Now when you have an accolade here, you actually have a successor. You can remove them or swap them out. That's just who's going to get them once this current knight dies. So going back to our knight screen right here. Uh, if they die, it's granted to the, their successor who meets the requirements. If none are available, then the accolade will become inactive until a replacement character is recruited to court. So when that happens, when you go to find successor, you'll have to click this button right here to seek a worthy successor. Because there are certain traits needed for certain of these. Uh, actually, you can see it right up here. They would need Sadistic, Callous, or Vengeful in order to be worthy of this accolade because of the Fanatic and the Marauder attributes. For they, that, That's their requirements. So we pop over here. Here's uh, what determines how many different accolades you can have. You can have up to five. I think currently we're allowed up to three, but we only have the one right now. Uh, then there's also this system of glory with the accolades. So as you can see right here, Fnatic is already level 1, it seems. And as glory goes up, boosts go up. So rank 1, I believe uh, you get the modifiers from the first one for 1, 3, and 5. And then you get modifiers from the second one for 2, 4, and 6. So the Marauder, rank 1, yeah, as you can see here, it gets 1, 3, and 5. So Leech Modifier monthly prestige for dread so that's you and then knight army modifier uncontrolled territory attacker advantage so that means when they're on attack they are doing better so as the glory reaches these new levels you'll get these perks so right now we're, i believe we're only level one so we don't get the boost from fanatic because you need rank two to get that it's a bit of a confusing system but it's actually really cool so let's actually scroll down and see what some of these accolades we have R. Let's open it up. So I actually kind of want to. Uh, oh, actually, you know, let's let's go through this real quick. So you get you gain the glory from uh, battle. So if your army is victorious, if you win a duel against another knight, if they attend activities, or if your le liege wins the war against the ruler with a high higher title rank. So if you're a duke and you would war with the king, your knights will gain glory. <clears throat> Once enough glory has been obtained, the accolade will rank up and grant the additional bonuses. There are six ranks, which will require these amounts of glory each. So, when you get choose, choose each trait, uh, as you get, I explained, there are the six ranks. You get a bonus for the primary attribute at rank 1. You get a bonus for the secondary attribute at rank 2. Rank 3, you get the primary. Rank 4, you get the secondary. Rank 5, primary. Rank 6, secondary. So it kind of keeps it uh, teeter-tottering. Now, let's just roll through these real quick. One thing I don't like about how the wiki is displaying this is there's actually more information here that it's not telling us. 
for example, you can see that the modifier here, you have liege modifiers and knight army modifiers. So they're actually different. So this is for Marauder, for example. Now we take a peek over here at Marauder. And it's not going to say anything about the liege bonus. So plus 2%. Perhaps it's that icon, but that icon is really just the prestige icon. Extra territory attacker advantage, extra monthly prestige per dread. So it's not super clear on that front, but they mix between commander bonuses and liege bonuses. So yeah, without further ado, let's kind of run through all of these. I'll kind of give you my pass-fail system on these. So first we have Contender. This gives you bonuses to the Hasta Looter trait experience gain and experience from the tournaments. Hasta Looter is a new trait that was added for the DLC. Uh, it's basically your ability to party, uh, to do tournaments, to kind of just be like a fun guy who likes going to events. Uh, it, it'll boost your archery, it'll boost your horse riding, uh, all, all of the things needed for the grand tourneys. So first rank you get 10%, second rank you get the 15%, uh, plus experience for all knights who went to tournaments, which is actually kind of nice, if you're going down a hostile looter build. And then 30%, 20, 20 10, 10 from all knights, and then bonus piety. This one's this one can be okay, but it's really more of a diplomacy build type uh, type accolade. And for that, I'd actually give it a fail. I, I don't want that on my knights more often than not. Next up, we have Manipulator. You get plus 10 Intrigue Scheme Power. That's actually really nice. Uh, bumps up to plus 20 at the rank 3 and 4. You get an extra Intrigue and Knight Effectiveness per Dread, 0.3%. That's pretty good. Dread goes all the way up to 100, so that'll actually boost up to 30% Knight Effectiveness at max. Actually very impressive. Uh, boosts your Intrigue scheme, scheme Power further, and gives you a higher Knight Effectiveness, and actually just gives you some Natural Dread. So this on its own will give you about 10% Knight Effectiveness just by having this, per this perk. Uh, I'd still say that's pretty good, but it's in most of the uh, the builds I go, that's not really what I want out of my knights. They're nice boosts, but they're not really uh, what I'm looking for in a knight. <clears throat> uh, Mentor. This one actually looks pretty good. You get a bonus knight, because knights are, one, are your more powerful units. They, they have commander traits of their own. They have their own prowess. They do, especially early game, a whole lot to make your army more powerful than... Uh, than its number. So having an extra knight disproportionately makes your army stronger than having an extra levy. Uh, and you get yet another knight on the rank 3 and 4. Prowess for children when they become 16. That's awesome. I, th I believe that's going to be the entire kingdom. Or may maybe it's just the uh, children of the liege. Because it doesn't differentiate here, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, extra, prestige extra prestige for children when they become 16. Uh, train commanders... Uh, it's Train Commanders is an activity that you can have your Marshal do instead of uh, Form Levies. So it'll occasionally grant Hasta Looter experience. Okay, that could be nice. <clears throat> you know, it's just an extra uh, thing in the pool. Even more Knights, even more Prowess, even more Prestige. And it's even more likely, I assume, for the Hasta Looter. Uh, I would give this a pass. I'd say this is a pretty good one. You generally don't have all these available to you at the same time. So uh, this is if you can have this one available to you, I definitely would not pass it up now the requirements as you can see on the right here you need whole of body or 15 learning in order to uh, ha have your knight get this trait so only specific knights will qualify for specific ones uh, next up we've got pot liquor uh, this is all about opinion here so you have your courtly vassal opinion minor landowner vassal opinion and minority vassal opinion now I believe to explain that if we go to our vassals it might make a bit more sense so we click on this guy right here, and he should have a trait of some degree. I believe it's this. Yes. Vassal Stance Minority. Every vassal has a vassal stance, which affects their opinion that they have with their liege, and which heir they prefer as the successor to the realm. Vassals in the same stance will like and dislike the same things. For example, all Gloryhound vassals dislike when you lose wars. Every vassal stance prefers one specific heir upon succession, each preferred heir will get an opinion bonus. If the primary heir is not preferred, they will instead get an opinion penalty. So it's basically just, uh, you know, factions without factions. They, they're they not organized, but 
they are shared interests. So we're going back. It's basically just giving you extra opinion with really some some of the more uh, obscure types of uh, of vassals. Get an even bigger bonus up here. Get learning. The scales of power. So this is minus 10 scales of power bal balancing point. That's actually an interesting one. So what that does is when you are, let's say, if you, you plan an activity. Uh, let's go on a hunt. We'll just, we'll go over here. I can't wait. So I should be sharing power now that I'm on a hunt. So this is the scales of power. Now, when you are sharing power, such as on a trip, at an event, on a pilgrimage, at a, a tour, you will have a regent now in the Tours and Tours tournaments DLC uh, controlling your realm for you. So they have a loyalty score which will determine whether or not they're going to try and usurp you and they also you can give them different uh, objectives mandates. So I like to set them to fill coffer coffers but that's just how I play you don't you can do it however you'd like. Now the scales of power as as they want more power because generally she, see as you can see she's my heir and sister she actually has a vested in interest in kind of uh, usurping the throne for me. So if she had the ability to she would sway these scales of power to the point where she could basically usurp it. So right here, the Regency can be entered at any time, and the Legion's capable, uh, but they can try and embezzle some gold from me. Here, uh, they can attempt to imprison people. Here, they can instantly forge claims on other vassals, and then here, they can entrench their Regency, becoming harder to remove and accessing more powers. They also get a free extra change to their contract. Pretty insane. So around here is really when you get a full uh, full revolution happening. So having the whoop, scales of power balancing point going minus 10 or minus 15 in your your uh, direction, definitely a good thing, but definitely situational as well. However, it is pretty good uh, if you were on succession. Let's say you built a giant empire and it's uh, barely together and then you just... You, you know your your big guy just died so you're going down to the next uh your next heir this might be enough to help keep you from uh exploding grant tours increase siege progress against vassals grant it's it's saying grand torns i don't really know what that means does it mean torny or just a tour either way uh i would actually still give this one a a fail uh it's not exactly what i like out of uh a knight once again uh, here we have Reeve, parochial vassal opinion, just another type of vassal. Stewardship, development in the least developed county from tournaments. That's kind of interesting. But it's not 50 development, it's 50 development progress. <clears throat> so it's not going to go f bring you from one development to 50 development. It's going to bring you... Boom. It's going to bring this pr development progress up 50 so it'll help you you know move up a single point fair and balanced honestly it's uh if it boosted your development up by 50 completely that'd be insane all right um same deal more stewardship increased control may grant additional control uh reeve okay but still once again just very administrative not super uh military focused so next up we have ta uh, Tactician. Now we're finally getting one of the first ones that's actually really more military focused. Uh, I suppose Mentor was as well. So Tactician, you get extra monthly martial lifestyle experience. I believe your um, knight also gets it. it boosts it uh, once again to 25%. You gain a marshal and your men-at-arms counter efficiency. So this is at, for the commander trait. So whoever that knight, whatever army that knight is in, their men-at-arms are 25% more effective against those that they counter. And then even more experience, more martial, and organized army task may increase levy reinforcement rate. This one, pretty good. Pretty good. I, I wouldn't say it's the best one, but it is... If you're uh, in a state of constant warfare, you've got some uh, people of a rival culture or military or, or uh, faith on your border, this likely won't steer you too wrong. So I will give it a pass for Tactician. 
Uh, next up we have Charmer. So Charmer, a lot like Manipulator. Seduction scheme power. Courtiers are now more vulnerable to all its seduction schemes. Extra fertility during feasts and weddings. Attraction opinion. Fertility during feasts and weddings. So, it, you know, this one is definitely situational, but I'd say along the lines of Contender in the first one. It's real uh, diplomatic and not very good for warfare, so I would I would give it a fail. I'm not trying to stay away from that. Uh, next, though, we get a really powerful one in Disciplinarian. 10% levy reinforcement rate at rank 1 and 2 is pretty significant, but then it doubles to 30, uh, sorry, 20% at rank 3 and 4, along with 10% levy maintenance reduction and 40% hostile county attrition for current army. That is massive. One of the biggest causes of casualties in this game are armies bearing attrition while you're in combat. Because when you pull an army up, let me uh, see if I can pull these guys right here. You can see their supply limit right here. So once they run out of supply they start to take attrition now you can tell if they're gonna run out of supply when you hover over a selection of soldiers and you tell them to go somewhere so you can see here the supply limit for Urbach is 4,745 troops so if I place fewer than 4,000 troops here or 4,745 troops here my troops will heal up gain supply and reduce their attrition but if I have more troops than that they're going to take attrition damage and use up their supplies. The same thing also applies when they are in hostile territory, or at the very least, not friendly territory. Um, attrition, they mostly get, though, when you're in hostile territory and you're walking across counties you haven't conquered. So, for example, let me look at... Uh, let's say I, I am attacking myself here. If I want, If I hadn't quite taken this yet, and I move my guys over to here... I'm going to take 100 troops minimum of attrition because I'm walking from one enemy controlled territory to another enemy controlled territory. Um, Alright, so let's pop back. Why this is good. Pumps it up again, 30% levy reinforcement rate and tw minus 20% levy maintenance. I forgot to mention, the levy maintenance is actually really insane. Unraised men in arms, court amenities. Uh, you know, I think that the levy maintenance will go up once we... Boom. So here we can see our army cost. The levies are actually not the biggest uh, part of our uh, cost. It's mostly the men-at-arms, but still. If we reduce that by 20%, that's minus uh, 0.4 gold. And then right here, that's going to be what? Uh, another 1.2. So we're, getting we're saving almost 2 gold per turn. Which, when you're negative 8, that's actually a pretty big, big difference. So... Bring this back. Let's see, we didn't lose it. All right. And minus 80% hostile county attrition for current army. Absolutely insane. So for this one, you need diligent, stubborn, temperate, organizer, or overseer. Honestly, all these are incredible traits. So having people in your uh, court with this is definitely recommended. Disciplinarian, I would give that up as one of the best. It's kind of a, a must get if you can. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of levies, they are, they're still important. <clears throat> Follow that up with Idealist. Uh, we have just a lot of opinion, more opinion, and even more opinion, and you get some prestige from a white piece. I see no value in this, personally. I, wh white pieces don't really do much for me. That Really, you only ever want a white piece if you're defending. If someone's attacking you and you want nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, for keeping a, a really... Um, complex realm together it might not be the worst maybe if you're doing a uh, clan tier government this may help but it's not what i generally look for uh, but then we have marauder this one is actually fantastic uh plus two uncontrolled territory attacker advantage so as i was explaining when you're in enemy territory attacking you're taking attrition and all that but when you take a fight in enemy territory the battle rolls will swing various different ways, and this adds plus two base to your to your rolls. So there are certain traits that will give your knights. Let me see if I have any. I gotta have one. Here we go. 
Cautious leader. Minimum battle roll plus four. Maximum battle roll minus two. So he he, he tends to get more uh, standardized rolls than a uh, average knight than, than a reckless knight. So, Bope, seeing that, you get a plus two just off the bat. Plus three off the bat. I believe they add together, so that's plus five. Plus another five advantage. At the end of this, you have plus ten advantage, which is absolutely insane. You know, the percentage extra prestige per dread, that's also really nice. I mean, uh, 0.7 times 100, you can get up to 70% prestige at max dread, which can be really insane. So I'd say Marauder is definitely one of the best, especially if you are going uh, tribal. If you're going to be some um, some Vikings, some Asatru, and start uh, invading people, spending a lot of time in uncontrolled territory, like raiding, for example, and your life exists based off of prestige, this is kind of a must-have, especially if you're tribal. Uh, following that up, we have Scoundrel. Minus 10% mercenary higher cost, 20% mercenary higher cost, extra martial per stress, mercenary higher cost, martial per stress. I hate this. This is terrible. Mercenaries can be extremely powerful, but they are just absurdly expensive. If you look, for the cheapest mercenaries right here, 866 stinky poopy troops is going to be 403 gold. At best, we're making 17 gold per turn. So that's like well over a year or almost two years or something of gold just on 800 stinky one-star low-quality units. So yeah, you know, if it's 20% cheaper, that would be nice, but that's what, 20 times 4, 80 cheaper, so it's, gonna be, it's still going to be 320 not really like affordable Boop. it definitely helps but I you know I'm just I don't like relying on mercenaries they they kind of uh, are a money sink they're really a, just a last resort so I, I would stay away from scoundrel if I were you however stalwart I would absolutely uh, take pretty much in any circumstance you have plus five travel safety that's always nice you know when you when you're going on your trips you don't want to be ambushed, so you have you have a knight to give you that just base, plus 10. But this is the big part right here, plus 10% army toughness. Plus 15% army toughness. So toughness is one of the standard traits of your units. Right here. Let's see what the game says. A soldier's toughness determines how much damage they can take in battle before they can become a casualty. So a standard levy has 10 toughness. My light horsemen here have 15, but... You can then boost that by 15%. I can my my brain math can do 10% easier, so this bumps our toughness of our light horseman here up to 16 and a half, or more, maybe like 17 when you when you uh, have the the final trait. Pretty big deal, especially because it applies to every single one. So I have 600 horsemen right here, 600 horsemen that are each 15% better. Pretty insane. It really really makes a difference. Uh, and that's just less likely to die. So, you know, let's say you, you uh, are fighting overwhelming odds, you win the battle, but, you know, you've taken some uh, some casualties and you start another battle too soon afterwards, the, uh, the amount of troops that the toughness saves you may be just enough to tip the scales in your favor. I've definitely seen it happen. Uh, so, stalwart, must have. Thug. Dread gain per tyranny. Eh. Dread gain per tyranny. Imprison chance. I mean, imprison chance is nice, but very situational. Generally, if you're trying to imprison someone, you're either guaranteed to get it or you're guaranteed to get a revolution. There's really very uh, very little, little middle ground where it's like, maybe. So, I mean, the 25% chance or 25 chance may be enough to make it viable, but I would kind of stray away from Thug because it doesn't do much. I mean, you could probably synergize the dread gain from tyranny with the prestige per dread and just kind of be a bit of a, a monster but that's just too situational however valiant is absolutely incredible 10 percent army damage 10 percent army damage at the lowest level that is a 10 percent bonus to the damage of the entire army that your knight is leading and because they are a uh a accoladed knight a uh, claimed knight they're probably going to be the army leader 20% army damage 
Extra Vassal Opinion. I mean, who doesn't like Vassal Opinion, right? It's a nice little icing on the cake. 30% army damage. Let me say that again. 30% extra army damage is insane. So let's say we look at my levies. 10 damage. Now my levies do 13 damage. Where's the... Uh, I don't have... Light footman. Boom. Light footman, 10 damage. Now they do 13. Along with their 15% extra toughness, they're just markedly stronger than any of my neighbor's light footmen. And I'm paying the same amount for them. Uh, man, where did it go? So Valiant and Stalwart, I would say, are probably the two best, especially if you can get them together. They really synergize in an insane way. You, you'll just straight up have an absolute giga chat of an army. <clears throat> uh, but you need Brave, Berserker, or Reckless, which are actually pretty rare tra traits. Whereas with this one, you need Unyielding Defender, which is the opposite of Reckless. Patient, Loyal, Honest, or Just. All right. Following that, we have Blademaster. Oh, wait, no, sorry, Fanatic. Uh, Fanatic is actually really good. Fanatic, extra zealot, vassal opinion. Boom. 10% holy war co re cost reduction. Now, I don't know about you, but I frequently end up in a, in a situation where I'm on the frontier of my faith and an opposing faith. So most of the wars I declare in this game are holy wars. Because it's easier to... There's less things to spend piety on than prestige, so I'd rather spend piety on declaring war than prestige, because prestige has just so many other uses. Whereas piety, once you've formed your holy order, uh, that's really that's really it. You know, unless you want to form your own faith, piety is just for for holy wars. So you gain extra just from joining, which is nice. You have holy wars pay for themselves by joining your friends' holy wars, and you make them even cheaper, and you gain even more. Really, just a pretty good one all around. Uh, I w obviously, if you can get Valiant and Stalwart, get those. But if you can't, Fnatic is definitely a solid backup. Following that, we have Blademaster. So you need the Aspiring Blademaster trait. I believe that is for only for young knights. So you need you would need a knight or someone on your court who is not yet old enough to be a knight, but is going to be. He's being trained for it. Extra Blademaster trait experience gain. Get the Aspiring... Blade Master trait in three years. Primary air gains it in three years. I don't know if that applies for the liege or for the knight themselves, but it is interesting because aspiring, aspiring Blade Master is a very good trait. Even more XP gain, more likely to get the thing, more XP gain. Nice but situational. The Blade Master trait is very useful, but given all of the other options for uh, attributes. It kinda, it's kind of underwhelming to, to put all your eggs in a single basket. Um, following that, we have Huntsmaster. Extra Venator trait experience. So it's a different type of troop. Or actually, no, Venator, I believe that goes with the Hunter. Uh, well, it makes sense because it's the Huntsmaster. Gain the Hunter trait in three years. Primary air gains it. But you can't be a vegetarian. Reduce chance for negative hunt events. So it's just more likely to turn you into a hunter if you have a knight who has this, is from is what it, it uh, reads to me, as well as your heir. You know, still not the worst thing, but situationally. If your realm is at peace, I might go for one of these to kind of help keep things safe. Uh, following that, we have Master of Revels. In a similar vein, it's just for the Eager Reveler trait. You gain a prestige per victory if this knight's in an army. That's kind of nice. Not a ton of prestige, but it adds up, especially if you... Uh, win a lot of fights. 75 prestige and extra feast and grand wedding invitation acceptance. That can be nice. Following that, we have Besieger. This one is also is actually incredible. They they kind of put a uh, the two, two of the best ones on the bottom here. Extra max size for siege weapon regiments. Incredible. What that means is if you are going here and building a siege weapon regiment right now our maximum size is 8. So we can keep cranking these until we have 8, but I can't make a ninth one. Unless I had someone with the Besieger trait, which would let me create a 9th Regiment. Reduces Siege Phase Time by 10%, and increases Daily Siege Progress by another 10%. Those two 
bounce off each other incredibly. Let's see if I can get a good example. Maybe I'll declare war on someone real quick. Disband. Let's try a little war. No, no wars. Really, no wars can be declared. Really, oh, I'm already adding activity. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter. You guys know how to play the game. But yeah, on, on every siege, there's the siege phase and the siege progress, and this is incredible. Cre increase the max size once again, and bumps it up to plus four for the max size. 20% phase time. Generally, between each siege phase, it's about two weeks. Uh, but with the logistician, or sorry, military engineer perk, it, I believe, reduces down to eight days, which with this is going to reduce down even further. I believe that's going to be, what, down to almost like six days. Maybe a little over that. Along with the Siege Progress. Which means, with, with the Besieger trait, you are going to be steamrolling through Sieges. Which on it is really incredible. There are so many times where you're sieging something, and on the last day of the Siege, the enemy uh, reinforcements happen to get to you and mess everything up. So, being able to do, to do a Siege quicker is always welcome in my brain. So, I'd say this is one of the best ones. Uh, and then follow that by House Paragon. House Members... In the same army are safer so when you this is really good for late game once you have a massive family uh your bloodline is just spread you have hundreds of members to the point where it's almost impossible to not have knights who are in your arm in your house so that this just makes all of your knights less likely to die because they all have your blood house members are safer children gain the house leader trait if it's allowed and even more important than anything Plus 5 monthly renown. Plus 15% monthly renown. And I believe these perks... Why is this listed twice? Weird. Uh, the the hard thing with this one, though, is that it requires Kin Dynasty level 4. Legacy 4. So if we go here, if we go to our family, and we go to our legacy. What you need for that is to go to Kin, and you got to go all the way down to 4. May create House Paragon Accolades. Bingo. So it, it's uh, a bit expensive because you don't really get these uh, legacies very often. You get maybe one or two a lifetime if you're lucky. <clears throat> it really depends on how much renown you're generating, which comes from the highest title held by you as well as the highest title held by all of your family. So getting 15% extra monthly renown is actually a massive bonus because it's very difficult to earn. So those are all the general um, accolades that you'll see coming in and out. So for a quick summary, I would say House Paragon is one of, is one of the best. Besieger is... I would say a never not. If you if you see this available, I would always go for Besieger. Following that, we also have Valiant, which is a must get, and Stalwart, which are is a must get. Uh, I would I would take Fnatic if the situation suits it. If, if there's a lot of people of uh, various faiths around me, I would definitely consider Fnatic. Uh, Marauder is also it's you're very unlikely to get the ones that you want. So you kind of need to work around it. For example, if we go here and try to create a new one, uh, we just, we actually don't have knights. So that's a bad example. Boop. But Mar Marauder is, is really good. Uh, I, if I was a, a Viking, I w think I would prio Marauder over really anything else. So for tribal, you want that. Uh, following that, Disciplinarian, also really incredible. Honestly, for tribal, if you get... Marauder and Disciplinarian, those two would bounce off each other very well. You're paying less maintenance for your levies. You're going to have a lot of levies because you're a uh, tribal leader. Attrition's going to kill you because you're raiding all the time. But you're gaining dread and you're stronger. Uh, following that, Tactician is also pretty good. If you have no other options, I'd say take it. It's not the worst thing you can do. 
And then mentor is uh, it also can't can't hurt. I'd say mentor and tactician I would put on the same tier. So if I had to truly truly sum it up, I would say that S tier are valiant, scoundrel, and besieger. Uh, a tier would be house paragon, fanatic, and marauder. And then B tier, I would go Disciplinarian, Tactician, and Mentor. I think I may mess that up a bit. But those, those are the best ones. The rest of them kind of are a waste of your time. Uh, following that, there are actually other accolades that exist that are a bit more obscure. As you can see by these requirements, they each unlock a unique type of men-at-arms, which I actually didn't know. They're really interesting but you require these very odd specific traits which honestly aren't all that odd but they are very specific right here you need a specific tradition war camels elephantry horse lords but that being said they do give you access to some very cool troops the red and you guys. We'll actually run through those real quick at the end here. Um, but yeah, so here, here we get Archer, Outrider, Pike Captain, Skirmisher, Vanguard, Lancer, and Cameler, Crossbow Captain, Elephant Rider, and Course Archer. So it's more or less one for each troop type if you kind of look closely. We got Elephants, Heavy, Skirmishers, Pikemen, Light Horsemen, Heavy Horsemen, Horse Bowmen, Archers, Riders, oh sorry, Crossbowmen, Camel Riders, and Regular Archers. Boom. So each will give a kind of relative similar boost for its own unit type. You get the max size for the regiments, which actually at plus 4, plus 6, and plus 8 are insane. Plus 2, plus 4, plus 6. If you go all the way down to elephants, let's see. Plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. That's probably the most modest one, but it's still very good. Uh, minus 20% elephant cavalry maintenance. That's actually really big. Elephants are in extremely expensive, so anything that makes them cheaper makes them better. Uh, along with the extra damage. Uh, it's interesting, though, that, that for most of these, it's not until you get to the rank 3 to 4 bonus where you can actually recruit the men at arms. So until that point, you're basically just boosting the standard troop of each type. Now, if we hop over to the troops of each type, why would you want this? What's what's the benefit? So let's look at our war elephants, for example. Cost 1600, maintenance 2.94, damage 400, and toughness 100. All right, so let's go to the regular war elephants. Boom. 1600, so it's four times as expensive, 2.94, costs the same 250 and 50 250 damage 50 toughness versus 400 damage and 100 toughness so it is almost twice as strong at four times the price which sounds insane but it has the same upkeep and you can stack them so it's not just you can have only one unit you can actually stack them up now do they have the max unit size here somewhere? I don't know if they do. I think that's based off of your era. Uh, let's look at another unit. Let's look at maybe the pikemen here. So cost 150, maintenance 0.9, 30 damage, 30 toughness. Pikemen. Cost 75, maintenance 0.9, 24, 22, 24. So once again, the retinue pikemen cost twice the price, same ma maintenance, and significantly stronger damage and toughness. One thing I will note, though, is that with the pikemen, they're really one of the better ones. They have advantage in mountains, in hills, and in desert mountains, along with two times effectiveness against every kind of horse, camel, or elephant, and no unfavorable terrain. Now, I believe that might also be the case with the standard pikemen as well. But it's just worth noting that they are pretty impressive units. 
Now, I believe that more or less sums up what I wanted to go over with this video. I hope that that helped kind of explain a bit of how to use the accolade system a bit more clearly. There's a couple other things that I'd like to show you if I were to retire this accolade. Let's do it. You'll now have a list of inactive accolades. I could also go on my decisions here and restore accolades. So what this means is if all the knights of an accolade were to die, the accolade itself is going to be dormant. So if you don't have even a single knight for it, you can't add someone to it. So you're going to need to you to call the herald to summon a knight who qualifies for the title. So right here, the guard commander of the Holy Roman Empire can be reinstated. So I can reinstate it or destroy it. So if I reinstate it, boom, he goes back. And I can swap out his successor for this guy who's not a knight or this guy who's not a court. But in order for them to be a successor for this, they need to be a knight. They can't have more than a barony, eight, eight prowess or higher, and they must have one of these traits because of the fact that I have Marauder and Fanatic. So I hope that that makes sense. So the difference between the restore accolade decision and uh, restore inactive accolades up here is that when, when it's here, the inactive accolades, you can there's still someone who qualifies for it. So occasionally something will pop up on the top of your screen saying, hey, act, an accolade, accolade can be reinstated. It's likely here right now. Yeah, the accolade can be reinstated. Or I could just create a new one. But I don't have any knights who, who would qualify for one. Versus this, which would be, you have an accolade that can be reinstated, but there's no one for it. Subtle difference, but it could save your life. So I hope that that kind of elaborates these mechanics to everybody, and uh, I hope that you know you, you uh, can use it to make your kingdom stronger. So just as, as a quick final summary, I just want to once again say that Stalwart, Valiant, Besieger are the three best, along with Disciplinarian, Marauder, Tactician, and Mentor. Everything else is kind of for the birds. Uh, and if you go out of your way to try and find Archer, Outrider, Pike Captain, Skirmisher, Vanguard, Lancer, Camel, Crossbow, Elephant Rider, or Horse Archer, I would actually recommend going for those. That th these are going to be really powerful if you can get these specific units. So it it's going to be a bit of a toss-up. Let let's say you qualify for both Valiant and Stalwart, but you could swap one of them for, let's say, like a Cameler. You know, it... It would be a hard sell for me to not grab the camel. But that is for you to decide and for you to uh, tell your own story with. So I thank you all for watching. And let me just pop open this barbershop. And I hope that everyone here has a great day. And good luck with your kingdom. Bye now.